Hello all, uh, welcome to another video and lecture from Professor Shima. Uh, I wanted to actually continue off of uh, the last lecture on sourcing strategy and specifically commodities. I know at this point you're probably getting sick of hearing about what a commodity is, but I just want to uh, revisit some of this because I probably made it sound uh, more tactical versus strategic than I had intended. Uh, when I say tactical, uh, I basically mean operational stuff that doesn't require uh, an enormous amounts of skill sets that most people could learn uh, simply through training and out of formal education in supply chain management. For example, my first time, uh, job in supply chain management was making sure that the material was at the right place at the right time, at the right, in the right quantities. Um, and that's very, very tactical. Uh, today, in fact, uh, technology does that for us. So basically, my first supply chain job, making sure stuff was at the right place at the right time in the right quantities at the right price, that job doesn't exist anymore because technology can do that. It can do it very well. In fact, it can do it better than I could when I did it over 20 years ago. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we develop strategic skill sets, skills that allow you to make better decisions both for the short term while also making decisions that are better for the long term. So uh, we want you to be able to talk to engineers. So we make you take engineering classes. We want you to be able to understand the terms and conditions of a contract or purchase order, which is a contract between a buyer and a supplier, uh, so that you don't get sued. So we make you take classes like Law 4860. We want you to be able to handle enormous amounts of data so you make better decisions and you don't say, well, hey, I'm going to source it from China because it's cheaper today, but then you find out five, ten years later, it actually ended up being more expensive uh, because of the total landed costs and total cost of ownership, insurance, freight, uh, quality issues, those sort of things. So. We've tried to uh, turn you into lawyers, negotiators, financiers, engineers. Why? Because these are the skill sets typically required uh, for entry-level managerial positions in supply chain management today. Uh, the jobs aren't tactical. The technology has replaced the tactical jobs. Likewise, the reason we push the business analytics minor is so that the technology never takes your job away from you. Uh, the business analytics minor started off with, hey, we're going to teach you how to use the technology so you can do things better, faster, and cheaper. In other words, it makes you better at your job. Now we do that, and we also want you to be able to actually manipulate and change the technology. So not only do you have to be a good user of the technology, you have to be able to actually change and manipulate the technology so that it can do what you want to do better, faster, and cheaper, and hence the business analytics minor. So I personally think if you stay on top of the technology, you'll never have to worry about the technology. In fact, if you stay on top of the technology, you'll actually probably prosper and flourish uh, professionally in supply chain management because that can help you do your job better, faster, and cheaper. Okay, now back to what I was talking about. In our last lecture, we basically said for commodities in general, the sourcing strategy has been to outsource your commodity needs. Why? Yeah, a lot of suppliers out there competing against each other driving down prices, driving down costs. That's what they do for a living. So chances are they do it better than you can if you did it yourself. So the decision is outsource, but then you actually have to pick the supplier, manage the supplier, evaluate them. And uh, that in itself is not tactical. So last time I told you how do you get the best price, typically the competitive bidding process. You want to make sure the suppliers don't pad their quotes. So sometimes you make it a one shot deal and when it's all said and done you go with someone and hopefully you picked a uh, low cost producer and likewise they meet your expectations on performance those being quality service and flexibility and then after that it doesn't stop uh, typically what happens in industry is when you award a supplier business especially for a commodity where there's lots of competition for that supplier you will typically award a long-term contract contingent on certain things. For example, this is where the strategic, strategic skill sets come into play and where the job becomes less tactical. Because I would agree, if you have suppliers bid on the business, the competitive bidding process, uh, there's technology that does all of that. You can have suppliers bid on the business uh, in one day using software technology like Reba and you basically identify the suppliers, you have them bid on it, and at the end of the day, you go with a low-cost bidder, assuming they've met all of your other requirements, like their ISO 9000 certified, their ISO 14000 certified. They can meet your service expectations, uh, even though they're located 3,000 miles away, that sort of thing. Uh, so with a commodity, 
once a supplier has been awarded business. What you'll typically say is, okay, I agreed to a dollar per part, but you're not going to pay a dollar per part for every part moving forward. The expectation is that if you give them the business long term and you tell them that the contract is for five years, that over a period of time, they should be doing things so that they get better, faster, and cheaper at what they do. For example, when they build the first unit, by the time they get to the 100th unit, they should have learned something that translated into a cost savings. So a period of time, you should be able to share in that cost savings as a buyer because you're giving, that, giving them that business over that period of time. So typically, when you award someone business and it's a commodity, there's a lot of competition. And you know, it depends. Uh, if you're the buying organization and you're much larger than the supplier, and for the supplier, you're a major, major customer. Obviously, in that situation, you have tons of negotiation power and leverage. There are some situations where you award a supplier business, and they might be three, five times the size of you, and they could take the business or leave it. Or if they do it for you, maybe you're 1% of their portfolio. In that situation, you might not have a lot of leverage. But in general, if you're the buying organization, for most of our students that graduate from the program, they tend to work for large organizations. So you as a buyer typically, typically will have some leverage over your suppliers because you are the customer that in itself would imply some leverage. But traditionally, the companies that recruit from our program uh, tend to be larger than the suppliers they award business to. So that's kind of advantageous for our students that become buyers in purchasing, procurement, um, or sourcing. So you award these suppliers the business and you say things like, I want an annual price cut on what I pay per part. Uh, the productivity gains that you get from making something over and over again, as the volume builds up over a period of time, there should be a learning curve and there should be a cost savings and productivity gain associated with that. So during the first year, you might say, I'm gonna pay a dollar per part. And then during the second year, we're gonna revisit the situation and we might have to agree on 98 cents per part. The following year, it might drop to 97 cents per part. The following year, it might drop down to 96 and then 94. Sometimes you agree to those up front where you say, I'm going to expect a cost savings of X percent per year over the next five years or the lifetime of the contract. Or you do it year to year where you reopen the contract and re-examine the situation and re figure out if you're paying a fair price based on the volumes they've been getting, the investments they've been making. You've awarded the supplier the business. They should be making investments in that business with you as a customer that allows them to do things better, faster, and cheaper. And because that came from the business that you gave them, you should be able to share in the productivity and cost savings associated with that. So you should insist and expect on paying less per part over a period of time. That's normal, that's expected, that's not illegal, that's not unethical, and suppliers expect that as well. Their reward is they keep getting more and more business. Now the key here is when you get a job, you're gonna already have contracts with suppliers, you're already gonna have suppliers that you're using, and you have to decide how much spend do I have, and a lot of your existence is gonna be justified in your ability to cut costs. For example, a lot of my students who graduate from the program might be responsible for five, 10, 15, 30 million in spend. They buy $30 million worth of stuff on behalf of their employer. So they go to all the purchase orders, the contracts between them and their suppliers, and they look at them. And they might look at one and say, wow, I buy a million dollars worth of parts per year from the supplier, and I've been paying the same price for three years. That doesn't even make any sense. So you reopen it, you renegotiate the terms and the conditions of the contract, you figure out if the supplier would agree to a lower price based on they've been getting the business from year to year and over that period of time you should have been learning things and learning how to do things better faster and cheaper why didn't the supplier come back to the previous buyer and say look uh, i've cut my costs i've widened my margins how about i split that with you or i still widen my margins a little bit but i share in some of that cost savings with you because i got it because of you because of the business and long-term business and volumes that you provided with me so that's when the job starts to get strategic yeah, competitive bidding, picking the supplier, all that stuff is very, very tactical. Uh, along the same lines, I wanna point out that technically speaking, when you have a contract with a supplier, you have a purchase order with them. Technically, most of the time, you're gonna be in jobs where the purchase order says, I can reopen, revisit, renegotiate the terms and conditions of this contract anytime I want, for whatever reason I want, as long as it's for competitive issues. So if you have a supplier and they're located in Ann Arbor 
and you drop them because you're a Spartan fan and you don't like the Wolverines, that's not a competitive issue. That's actually discriminatory in nature and you open yourself up to liability that way. If you have a supplier and it's a female owned business, you can't say I'm dropping that supplier because I don't want to do business with a supplier that's run by a female. That's discriminatory in nature. You can't tell a supplier they're not getting the business or drop them because you said all their employees are overweight or too short. That's discriminatory in nature. You can reopen, renegotiate, and have suppliers rebid on the business anytime as long as it's for competitive issues. For example, let's say their quality is starting to go down. Let's say their service is getting worse. They're shipping stuff late. Let's say they're becoming less flexible, meaning you've changed some volume requirements and they can't keep up with you. Uh, or you lowered the volume requirements and they still ship the same amount and said, we agreed to this, so you have to pay this. Those are competitive issues. And one of the major competitive issues out there is price. If you feel like you're paying too much, you can reopen and revisit the contract. So a lot of my students will take entry level managerial positions in purchasing, procurement, or sourcing as buyers. And back in my day, those jobs were very, very tactical. The technology now does all the tactical stuff for you. So my students today basically tap into strategic skill sets, soft skills, hard skills uh, to manage their spend. And typically for commodities, uh, what you're doing is, what you're trying to do is, one option is you could reopen the contract and have the supplier rebid on the business along with a bunch of other suppliers. And you could do that competitive bidding thing all over again. The problem with that is if you simply reopen a contract and have the supplier rebid on the business and you pit that supplier up against other suppliers and you just basically do the competitive bidding thing again, all you're basically doing is hacking away at that supplier's margins. The data shows that when buyers go into a job and they reopen the contracts and they have existing suppliers rebid on the business, the vast majority of the time, the original supplier keeps getting the business. They've just agreed to a lower price because of the competitive bidding process. So all you've done is basically pit them against other suppliers, get them to agree to a lower price. All you've done is taken their margins and shrunk them. And from their standpoint, you've made them less competitive because if you shrink their margins for them, yeah, you pay less per part, you save money, good for you. But if their margins are smaller, their ROI goes down. How excited are they about doing business with you if your purchasing strategy for managing them is hacking away at their margins and getting them to shrink their margins uh, because they've agreed to a lower price? Unfortunately, that's a lot of what goes on out there. So you get a million in spend. Let's say you could cut your supplier's price by 10% through competitive bidding. You've just saved your company $100,000 a year. Maybe it took you one day using Ariba software technology where you had them bid on the business or rebid on the business online competing against a bunch of other suppliers. So you go to your boss and you say, I've just cut our cost by 100,000. I did that in one day and you're only paying me $60,000 a year to work for you. Your boss says, that's fantastic. From the supplier's perspective, all they've done is agreed to a lower price and you haven't helped them cut their costs, so all you've done is shrink their margins. Now, the other side of that is, if the supplier agreed to, say, go from a dollar per part to 90 cents per part, why didn't you get that price two years ago when they were awarded the business? Again, we go back to, if they can make money at 90 cents per part, why did they submit a bid at a dollar and why did you agree to it if they would have been okay with 92 years ago? So a part of this again is at the very beginning of the process of picking a supplier, trying to really determine what their best price is. And if, vast, if the vast majority of the time when you're opening these contracts and have them rebid on the business, the same suppliers are getting the business just at a lower price, uh, something at the beginning of the process went wrong where you weren't getting the best price possible. Uh, you can make the point that over a period of time, they've been able to lower their costs and be profitable at the new price. Uh, and that's probably a, a part of it as well. Now, what I want to tell you is a way to go into your jobs in a more productive, strategic, long-term thinking kind of way is maybe don't just hack away at their margins through the competitive bidding process. Now, I understand if times are tough, you're in a recession, your company's not making money, they're bleeding and you have to cut costs, maybe reopening the contracts and having suppliers rebid on the business is a quick fix to generate a cost savings, which is basically adding money to a company's uh, bottom line. And that's typically what companies will do during recessionary periods. But if you're going through tough times, 
Aren't your suppliers likewise going through tough times? And all you're basically saying is, I'm gonna shift some of that burden from me to you so that we can all suffer together. That's what happens. Uh, the other problem with getting suppliers to basically lower their price without helping them cut their costs is typically they don't lower their prices a lot because they can't. So you reopen the contract, you haven't re rebid on the business, you're paying a dollar per part. Maybe they agree to 98 cents per part. Okay, that's a uh, 2% cost savings on a million in spend. Uh, that's what still twenty thousand dollars in cost savings that's not bad uh, what if it's a hundred million in spend and that would be what uh two hundred thousand dollars that's 20 so yeah forget the math um my point is the cost savings opportunities through competitive bidding and hacking away at their margins can be significant if you're dealing with enormous amounts of spend but as a percentage you know, 2%, 1%, yeah, it all adds up, but uh, is it worth it? And if it upsets your suppliers because all you've done is shrink their margins, uh, I wonder if it was worth it. Okay, so what's the better way? All right, the better way is to help suppliers reduce their costs without messing with their margins. So you're paying a dollar per part, you say that's too much. Rather than reopen the contract and have the supplier rebid on the business and pit them up against other suppliers and hack away at their margins, what if you sat down with your supplier, visited your supplier, went to their facilities, had meetings with them, sent in your engineers to talk to their engineers, and did more creative things that help them reduce their costs so you don't mess with their margin, which might be two, three, four, five percent. And as a result of that, you probably get a greater uh, cost reduction per part. So the competitive bidding process might have taken the cost or price from a dollar to 98 cents. What if meeting with them and working them over a six month time period reduces it from $1 to 94 cents to 92 cents without messing with their margins as a percentage. And then you save way more money per part. And from their perspective, you haven't changed their margins but you've lowered their costs and now they have more resources to reinvest and build up their business and do more business with you. So it tends to be win-win. It's just, you gotta be strategic. It's a time commitment. You have to make investments and commit resources to do this. And you have to be creative and you have to major in supply chain management to learn how to do some of these things. For example, if you have a company like John Deere that outsources a bunch of commodity kind of stuff to a bunch of small to medium sized suppliers, those small to medium sized suppliers, even the large ones, they have to buy raw material to make those rubber parts, plastic parts, and metal parts. And when they buy that raw material from the mills, uh, their price per unit per pound per ton might not be very good. They might be paying a premium because they have to buy them in low volume because they're small to medium sized companies. So imagine this, what if John Deere told all of their suppliers, we'll buy all of the raw materials for you. We're John Deere, we're huge. We can buy that stuff in gigantic amounts and we can pay less per unit per ton per pound per ounce than you can yourself because your purchasing volume is so much smaller than ours collectively. So then when you buy the raw material suppliers, you buy it from John Deere at a much lower price and then you share that cost savings with us so that when we buy the parts from you, we pay less per part. That's creative, that's not illegal, that's not collusive. The Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission will have no issue with that whatsoever. It's actually very creative. It's supply chain management, doing things better, faster, and cheaper. Those are just the many, many ways of being strategic and creative and problem solving, uh, tapping into your soft skills, your hard skills. Maybe you're outsourcing something from China and you look at tons of data. I'm talking 700,000 lines worth of data over a five to 10 your time period, and you've been sourcing something from China, and you look at the data and realize, wait a second, we thought we were paying a dollar per part. When it's all said and done because of lead times, inventory, quality issues, freight, insurance, because it's coming from thousands of miles away, we're not paying a dollar per part. Our total cost has actually been a dollar thirty, a dollar forty per part. And then you say, wait a second, there's a supplier right down the street from us that can do it for a dollar ten, a dollar twelve, a dollar fifteen. Yeah, that's a lot more than a dollar per part, but it's a lot less than a dollar thirty or a dollar forty. There's another example of an entry level managerial position in supply chain management where you use strategic skill sets to make better decisions. There's nothing tactical about that. In fact, to make that decision, you need data, lots of data, accurate data, and then once you have it, you have to make sense of it. And then once you make sense of it, 
you have to visualize it. So you use your ERP system to get the data, to scrub it, to clean it. And then you use something like Excel uh, to make sense out of it. Then you make sense out of it, and then you gotta visualize it using things like Power BI or Tableau. So I just threw out a bunch of buzzwords there like Excel, Power BI, Tableau, ERP. You're learning all of these skill sets in the ISM program, especially if you're a BA minor. Uh, what would be some other examples? Let's say you've got a supplier, you got two suppliers for a part, and you have two suppliers because you want to minimize risk. Like what happens if the supplier goes out of business, if there's a fire, if there's a strike. So you're outsourcing something, you split the volume up 70, 30, 50, 50, 60, 40. The downside to that is when you split up volume, chances are you're paying more per part from each supplier than if you just gave all of the business to one supplier and gave them all of that volume because they would have the economies of scale to reduce their per unit cost. So if you need a million parts a year and you give one company 700,000 units and another one 300,000, uh, whatever your average price per part is, chances are it's more than if you just gave all of the 1 million units to one supplier because economies of scale should be able to generate a cost savings that they can share with you. So what you could do is you could say, wait a second, uh, we've split it up 70-30 and the one that has 70% of the volume is located right down the street from us. They've been perfect on service. I don't see any risk of single sourcing and giving all of the business to them. In fact, I'm gonna go sit down with them and say, hey, wait a second, what if I gave you this other 30%, these 300,000 units a year, what would my price drop down to? Maybe they say, well, it'd go from a dollar to about 97 cents per part. And then you look at the cost savings and you say, it's worth it, the risk is minimal, and the cost savings is enormous because each part is, say, $1,000 would buy a million units a year. You do the math, that's a big number, a 3% cost savings uh, probably justifies your existence several times over. So competitive bidding, commodities, outsourcing, a huge part of sourcing strategies for most companies out there that you're gonna end up working for. And all I'm trying to say is be creative, think long-term, be strategic. And one of the ways you do that is you help suppliers cut their costs, especially their direct costs, direct material, direct labor. As I mentioned in a previous presentation, when a supplier tells you it's gonna cost you a dollar per part to buy this from us, what goes into that dollar? direct material costs, all the stuff that actually goes into what they're making for you. They're making uh, a car or a widget, nuts, bolts, all the material that goes in that product are direct material costs. The people that actually build that stuff in the factory on the assembly lines, that's direct labor. If it costs a dollar per part, the vast majority of that one dollar is in direct costs. The vast majority of that typically tends to be in direct material costs. In general, anytime you buy something that you can hold in your hand, so if you can hold it in your hand, or if you can drive it, if you can put your laundry in it, the vast majority of the time when you pay for something, about 50, 60, 70% of that number is how much the company spent on buying materials, okay? Most of the material that a company uses to build a product is outsourced. So most of the cost savings opportunities for companies are not within their own companies, but in their supply chain and with their suppliers. So again, if companies are outsourcing almost everything, especially commodities, and they wanna cut costs and pay less per part, most of the cost savings opportunities are actually in their supply chain. It's in direct material purchases. So you as a buyer are the source of cost savings for your company, and you as a buyer have to tap into helping your suppliers reduce their direct costs. And I would suggest that more so than just hacking away at their margins. Uh, the auto industry is infamous for hacking away at supplier's margins. Why? The auto industry has really thin margins, like one, two, three, four, five, max, 10%. They sell a car for $1,000, they're lucky if they make five to 10 cents. With those really, really thin margins and wanting to widen their margins, they need to cut costs. Where do most of their costs come from? Direct material purchases. Uh, basically, not only is the auto industry outsourcing almost all of their commodity needs, they're basically outsourcing all of their needs. So you take an industry like the auto industry and you ask, what is its core competency? What does it have to be really good at to the point where if they're really bad at it, they're not going to exist? Yeah, technology, engineering, design, all of that stuff matters. Those are core competencies in the auto industry. But at the same time, when you look at engineering, design, and technology, a lot of that stuff is actually being outsourced and moving forward, more and more of it's gonna be outsourced. So if you take industries like aerospace, automotive, 
uh, heavy equipment, farming equipment, things like that. If you look at their sourcing strategies, not only are they outsourcing almost all of their commodity needs, they're outsourcing almost all of their needs for all materials and all services. So what's their core competency if they're doing that? Supply chain management. They're all outsourcing to the same suppliers. Whoever can manage their suppliers the best and get them to do things better, faster, and cheaper are the ones that'll be most competitive. Okay, that's it on this lecture. I'm probably wrapping it up on commodities and that part of the sourcing strategy. Uh, next and moving forward, I'm probably going to talk about what if it's not a commodity and how do you outsource stuff where, wait a second, that supplier is bigger than me. Wait a second, that supplier has technology and engineering and design capabilities that blow mine away. Or uh, I have to outsource this to save money to competitively price my products and I'm admitting that I'm going to outsource something where the design secrets are very important. So how do you do stuff like that? How do you manage these suppliers where there's a lot at stake? If you outsource a widget and that supplier raises their prices, that's okay. You got 2,000 other suppliers to choose from. If you outsource nuts and bolts to a supplier and they go out of business, that's okay. You got 500 other suppliers to choose from. So on commodities, you got all these options out there and there's nothing really for them to learn that could become a competitive threat to you. For core critical strategic stuff, there's a lot at stake there. And when you outsource core critical stuff, you have to manage that process and those suppliers differently than you do with commodities. And I'm telling you right now that for the majority of the companies that recruit from the ISM program, not only are they outsourcing almost all of their commodity needs, their sourcing strategy long-term is to outsource everything so that when it's all said and done, all they really do is supply chain management, manage their suppliers and manage outsourcing. Uh, and that's what we'll talk about next. Thank you and see you soon.